here. The room is um, very alive, sound is big in here. So I just want to be sure that most of you can hear. <laughs> I hope all of you. Um, welcome, welcome on this very beautiful day to this lovely place. We're all so lucky. Um, I have three wonderful people here this evening, and I hope a marvelous conversation about place and how we see and um, our relationship to place. That's sort of the deep subject here is, what is our relationship to place? Um, why do we keep returning um, to the same places, and how do, they, how do those places um, come to have meaning to us? The structure of tonight is, uh, uh, I'm going to be asking some questions of our speakers. I'm going to introduce them in a moment. And then I'm going to turn, uh, we'll have a conversation for a little while, and then I'm going to turn the conversation over to all of you, because I know you'll have questions as you hear the conversation tonight, questions I won't think to ask. So I'm counting on all of you to bring your good questions to this conversation. I uh, want to begin um, by asking a question that um, is only sort of tangentially related, um, but it's a way to bring our speakers' voices into the room and uh, to give a little uh, glimpse into who they are and how they came to be here. And I'd like to begin with Elizabeth. Elizabeth Farish is the chief curator, as you all know, of Strawberry Bank. And um, she is really the um, prime mover of this event. And uh, the question I want to ask Elizabeth to begin is, um, think back to when you were six or eight or 10, because all of us have that child still in us. Um, think back to that time and um, see yourself at six or eight or ten. What are you doing that um, might have might be a kind of sign or predictor of the fact that you would become a curator? Well, hello everyone, and <laughs> I welcome you as well. When I was a child that age, I lived in a tiny village in England, and I spent most of my time with a 70-year-old man who um, didn't have heat, he didn't have running water, he lived in this stone cottage, as did I, and it was just sort of a different way of life, and he told me all of these stories, much like in New England, I think that English people, some English people, sort of live with their history. It's a part of their lives. It's not something that necessarily they are thinking of as the past, but sort of as their contribution in the present. So I think that it was Jimmy, Jimmy Fowler, and that, that old romantic building that mm. I spent so much time in. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Our, um, we're so glad you're here, Elizabeth, and part of this conversation. Elizabeth is going to provide some of the sort of um, larger context for how we see this place, and we'll come back to her with some questions about Strawberry Bank and the properties here in a moment. Um, Sherm Pridham is another of our speakers tonight, and welcome, Sherm. I'm so glad you're here. I wonder if you could go back to six or eight or ten and see yourself doing something that might have predicted that you would become Portsmouth Public Library's director for 28 or 30 years, was it? Uh, yes, yeah, yes, years. yeah. Um, my, um, the easy answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, There's nothing. Uh, I, I, I can't, I, I um, um, w as a librarian, I tried to uh, work against the stereotype, the stereotype being somebody who's quiet and calm and collected and well-organized. I did everything I could to avoid doing that. Uh, but your question is an interesting one. And if I go back in, in, my, in my life to you know, where I, what I became, uh, I remember as a little kid, I had allergies. And uh, the other thing that I, so I could, a lot of things I couldn't do. I, my, my father would say, well, 
can't work on the Navy, oh, you got too many allergies. And then uh, I would try to go lobster fishing with you know, the fishermen here, and I get deathly ill every time I go out. <sighs> so he says, well, yeah, can't be a fisherman either. You may as well go to school or something. I don't know what you're going to do. So that maybe was the reason I went, you know, kind of the educational bent rather than the trades bent. So Thank you. Come up with. Thank you. Patrick Healy. Patrick Healy is a landscape painter and the artist whose work graces these walls. And um, along with Sherm, we're going to be sort of exploring this whole notion of outside in, how we, how we see when we look at something on the outside and you know, what informs our thinking, and what's the life going on on the inside. Um, before we do that, Patrick, I have the same question for you. Uh, you're six, eight, or 10. What are you doing that? Well, well a lot yeah. of my friends will say I'm still six, eight, or 10. So, <laughs> um, the question is, so what am I doing now then? I, I remember we played basketball, football, or something, and, and I would go home and get something to eat, and I watch TV, and I put this piece of wood on the arms of the chair. And then I'd get some paper and, and some markers, and I'd be making art. I never talked about it. I thought, like, all the other guys did that. So, so I, I was always making art, but I just never thought to ask, don't you do that when you go home? So I was probably always making art. I always liked it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, welcome to all three of you. I'm so glad to be here with you. My name's Kimberly Green, and I'm a poet, and I'm interested in, as, we've, as I've been alluding to, the power of images, as well as in the experience of seeing, what informs our seeing. I'm also aware that images both reveal and conceal. Um, there's a way in which, um, when we look at anything, um, we think we see all of what's there, but um, very often there are, there's a life interior to what we're seeing that isn't necessarily accessible to us, but the thing that we're seeing might suggest it or our imaginations sort of take off and we begin to wonder about what's behind the windows um, inside the house. Um, so I try to see what's given as well as what's in some sense interior, a life suggested or pointed towards. Um, I'm also aware that all of us have homes, um, and we tend to them, we care about them. And when I came to Patrick's beautiful show, I was, I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to be here for the opening or visit the show between then and now, but one of the experiences I had was, um, you know, standing in front of each image was a, sense, a kind of longing to enter them, longing to move into that space, those beautiful, beautiful homes. Um, so I want to begin this conversation about um, home and what we see and what we don't see and how we see with um, questions for Elizabeth. Elizabeth, um, I understand the role of the curator to be a kind of keeper of a story, that that's part of what you're doing is keeping the story for all of us. Would you tell us a little about what you're faithful to in your work? Um, I'm curious about what vision or commitments or values inform your work as a keeper of a place and its story. Well, in a word, um, I think authenticity is the most important thing to strive for. You know, we're working with houses and families and things and stories that um, we may not have all of the facts to. In preparation for this, I was reading about um, the early, early inhabitants of what we now call the Shapley Driscoll House, which is the house that Sherm grew up in when he was a child. And I was reading about the shopkeeper, John Shapley, who we interpret on one side of the house. And in this reading, it was described to me that he was always um, described as a mariner and not a shopkeeper, and that his store if you've been into the house, you'll see that the front room is set up as a shop, and then that shop would not have been fully stocked, that his primary um, business venture was to be a mariner, not to be a shopkeeper, and over the years, and I've certainly contributed to this, I've added things into that shop, trying to give visitors um, a greater sense of what 18th century, almost 19th century goods were, which, because we're doing this today, I've just learned is not being authentic to that family's 
actual past. So I'm going to have to go take out some bolts of fabric and put it, you know, put it back to what the facts actually tell us and that John Chapley was a mariner by trade. He happened to have a small shop. <laughs> So you, you're, you're constantly inter interpreting and reinterpreting as you learn. As new information, if new information, or mm -hmm. even information that hasn't been looked at for 20 years is revisited and reevaluated, um, you know, not the overarching interpretation perhaps, but the details of it, the details of people's lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your decision to, um, uh, well, actually, before I, I ask you that, I, I'm, I'm interested if you could tell us, give us a big picture description of this property, what it was and what it is today, and just a little bit of the history of how it made that transition from what it was originally and what it is today. Well, it's not a very brief story. I know, <laughs> I know. You're gonna give us the brief version. Um, well, first and foremost, I think, well, I hope most people in this room understand that that big green space behind us is all filled in, that it, it was a tidal inlet, um, and that what we call the Puddle Dock neighborhood was an important beginning place for Portsmouth. Um, the great house that was built in, you know, during first period contact was just across the street in Puddle Dock, and the economy and the um, construction boom that happened after that really happened right out here. Um, the Sherburn House is the one remaining first period house that we have on this site. So back to John Shapley, during that time it was a very booming, um, well-established town, you know, Details like the War of 1812 and the um, ensuing embargoes really brought on a decline. And you know, as the economy ebbs and flows, so does this neighborhood. There would have been a lot more 19th century construction that you see today because, you know, skipping over the 19th and ha first half of the 20th century, um, urban renewal was happening all over the country, and it certainly happened in this neighborhood. And the city basically condemned the property. And then there was this big preservation effort that has led to what you see outside now, which is not a place that would be recognizable by any 18th, 19th, or early 20th century resident. Um, the idea when Strawberry Bank was created was that any building that was on the map of 1812 would be saved and that everything else would be torn down. And that's a really long time of building history that got torn down, mm -hmm. um, including, of course, all the outbuildings and things like that. So what you see now is basically sort of, in a part, a sanitized view of what this neighborhood would have been. Um, you know, there, in the 19th and 20th centuries, there are many different people from many different countries living here, lots of different languages being spoken, um, lots and lots of corner stores, a lot of commerce going on. And, you know, of course, we have the Abbott store, but as a museum goer, um, we try hard to create that for visitors, but it, it's not a lived in neighborhood, so it's changed a bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. And uh, a final question that's come out of what you've been speaking about. I'm guessing there's a kind of tension between um, your work as a keeper of the story here and the ongoing life of any community, that things are always changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. Does that, is that fair to say that there's a kind of tension there for you? Well, I don't know, no, I don't know for me. I think yeah. perhaps historically, I think that the more time goes by and the more recent history becomes just as much an important piece of the history than John Chapley's shop was. To me, Sherm's history is just as important as an, any earlier residents that were living here. Mm -hmm. So I think the tensions sort of shift um, and further interpretation will acknowledge things that the original interpretations didn't. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Can I yes, please. Yeah, um, I'd, like, I'd like to pick up on the authenticity that uh, Elizabeth mentioned that um, I'm kind of new to history. I, I was a librarian and that's what I did and I sort of avoided the history. And uh, as I've gotten into it now, uh, this is the discovery of uh, the authenticity has been very exciting. I 
had no idea, as a, for instance, how far my family went back into this neighborhood. Uh, I like to brag now, and I will right this moment, that um, John Davenport was my great, great, great something or other grandfather, and he was one of the people who put up the Liberty Pole. And so my family's been here for a very long time, and I think that uh, looking at you know the authentic, as Elizabeth is doing, brings out those things, those things that were um, historically not only um, uh, ignored, but actually um, but there was, <laughs> to get um, the place condemned, um, there was a lot of um, uh, work done, you know, to make it look even worse than it was. Um, I won't go into that right now, but that's, that happens to be, I think, the case. And uh, now, hopefully, we're looking at, uh, gee, those were actually people that were living down there in mm -hmm. Viz. Um, you know, and it's, 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 to me, a really exciting thing to do, you know, to see that people are looking at uh, the 1950s and, and, and looking at it with a, a little bit of a different uh, and, and, a, and a more inclusive eye, I think. And I, I think that's really good. The authentic is extremely important. Thank you, Sharon. We're going to pick this thread up again a little bit later in the conversation. Um, Elizabeth, could you just let us know why, uh, how you came to the idea of inviting Patrick to come and paint here this summer as artist in residence, and um, what what inspired that idea? And then I'm going to turn the question over, some questions over to Patrick. Well, some of you may know that the special. 2017 exhibit in our Roland Gallery is called The Painted Past, and it is a um, collection of items from the museum collection that are painted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I thought that, you know, these inanimate objects, they might be beautiful and interesting, but to have a painter actively working and have the tools of painting, and I was really into the smell of painting. I was like, Patrick, more turpentine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought it would, you know, enhance for the visitor what a painter does. Thank and you. he paints things that are very important to me. The collection of houses in this neighborhood are important. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but of course I am putting you on the spot <laughs> um, in all my questioning. Uh, is there something in Patrick's paintings that speak to you personally in terms of your, your own sort of emotional response both to this place and your life here as curator and the images that Patrick creates? Well, I like to look at them because I would say 95% of the time I know which buildings they are, but sometimes I don't, mm -hmm. and it makes me look at their lines and angles and the shadows in a slightly different way and it makes me think beyond the people that I know who lived there and how these buildings aren't special just to me and maybe the people who work here or have worked here, but everyone who comes and walks their dog or it just passes by, everyone has a relationship with these buildings and this is how Patrick sees them and I see them in my way and Jerm obviously sees them in his way and it's mm -hmm. there looming in Thank our you. community. Thank you. Looming, that's good. I like that. <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> These houses have been the object of your fascination for a long time. And I'm wondering what originally drew you to them and what has sustained your interest in them. So it's a sort of two-part question. I'm interested in the evolution of your relationship to these. Sure to these places? Yeah. I was thinking about that this morning. Back in 1990, I came to Portsmouth, opened a uh, live workspace on uh, Market Street. And at that time, I had a lot of paintings from the city of Lowell where I grew up in that were more in the direction of Edward Hopper. But I had started doing large abstract paintings. So people were buying my old realist work. And I tell people I basically painted myself out of business because they weren't buying my abstract. But then one day I was at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and I was really full of myself as being this big abstract painter. And wasn't I wonderful? And I looked in this gallery, I was walking by, and this very small Bonard painting was in the room. And it was the most like, powerful painting. It just stopped me in my tracks. And I had to run over and look at it. And it 
taught me a, a lesson right there that you don't have to make a giant painting. I mean, this painting in the back, it's not that big, but it's really fun when you're in front of a painting like that because you're kind of immersed in the color field, and that's really wonderful. But I had lost the sense of why a small painting can be strong. So I thought to myself, I'd like to make small paintings, but how am I going to, because what happened in an abstract painting is I'll, I take like the color blue and then I just take off with it and I have all this space to play with it. So, but I thought, okay, what if I make them small? There won't be enough space to take off with blue. It, it'll, you know, it can stay more real. So I actually walked over to Court Street and looked into Strawberry Bank and looked over one of the fences, kind of like in the bottom of this painting over here. Many of my paintings have a fence at the bottom because many of these buildings have a fence. And I started with Strawberry Bank paintings and they were much more realistic than these. But over time, some of the sensibilities from the abstract work started to come through again, but I didn't need as much space now to, to, to use those abilities. And I kind of stayed in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in, I think a, pa a painting to me, taking a rectangle and creating an interesting structure within the rectangle. And I use these houses and rooftops and fences and little landscapes to do that. And then I want to play with color. And that's really how I, I talk about it. I know when people are thinking of spending money to buy a painting, they don't want me to say I want to play. But that's what I want to do. I want to play with color and see if I can hit a certain note that kind of resonates to me, whatever a strong painting is. So this place, I mean, I could make paintings here forever because these buildings continue to, well, give me layouts where I can take off and do what I want to do with paint. So that's, that's the answer, I guess. Mm -hmm. Can, I'm going to push you a little bit on this. So when you look at one of the houses as a painter, what are you seeing? The and rhythm, the rhythm of the rooftops and, and, the, and the fences. And then if there's something in that rhythm that I don't want there, I get rid of it. And, and then I'm, I'm excited to start with a color. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. I, I don't necessarily see the history that so-and-so right. lived there. I don't see any of that. Right. I, I, I was in a show in Chicago and I did some Mills and Lowell and this fellow who was with the Communist Party approached me and he was all excited and he said, you know, these mills, this is all about the workers and the people. And I'm like, no, nah, no, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a big rec, red rectangle where I can play with windows. And it's more about music. And it was like, so, you know, I think of color as notes and sound. So I'm trying to like make a little musical composition in a way, but with paint. Can you talk about um, the uh, elements of structure, color, and uh, I'm going out on a limb here, tension, and how those uh, elements, in color, those four elements perhaps, how those elements uh, work in these paintings? And what are you trying to kind of resolve uh, around those four things? I don't know the answer to your question. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> but I could say that if you think of a painting because I, I, once I made 100 paintings because I was away from paintings for a couple of years working on our house and I'm the slowest carpenter in America. So I thought, okay, instead of just painting, I want to jump in and find out what my work's really about again. So I'll hold myself to like four days. I'm not worried about a finished piece. I just want to jump in and make something and move to the next piece. And if I, and I didn't say I'm gonna make 100 pieces. I thought I'll just do this four day thing. And then after like six months, it was averaging like 10 pieces a month and it ended up being 100 pieces. But it, it gave me the ability to see what I'm really interested in. And so I didn't worry about if a piece was fully resolved or not. And some really good pieces came out of that. So I use those pieces as a library for, for the work I do now. And then occasionally I, I will look at a piece. I'll have them around me in, in my studio and th th that's, that's the level I want to, if it's a game, that's the level I want to play the game at, you know, some of my stronger pieces. Mm -hmm. so Thank that, you. That, that, it has nothing to do with your question, but I enjoyed that. that was okay, <laughs> you enjoyed that question. <laughs> so I, I will share with all of you that uh, this is a little aside. Um, I've pushed Patrick on this question before tonight. And, you know, what is it, Patrick, that draws but, you but to I these didn't, houses? I didn't, didn't read it because I'm thinking, I said to myself, if I can't answer that question, then I, then I think I'm not going to have a, because I can't do package dancers anyway. No, I'm no, always, I know. I'm always shoot from the hip. Yeah, so yeah. It wouldn't have, it would have oh, made I, me a nervous wreck to read that I, question. Believe me, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I was preparing the questions for Patrick tonight and thinking, whatever. <laughs> But I, I uh, have pushed him on this question of, um, you know, deep subject, deep relationship. You know, what is it that draws him to this subject? And 
I had a couple of email exchanges with him, and, and I finally got the most amazing thing. Oh. I got an email back that said, oh, Kimberly, I think I have an interesting answer for you. <laughs> look at this and there was an attachment in the email and I opened the attachment and what opened was this image of what turned out to be the cover of his first grade reader from the village he grew up in in Germany which is on the back post back there unfortunately I think it's too small for you all to be able to see it but do take a look at it before you leave tonight because the houses in the village and the landscape, I mean, it's Portsmouth, <laughs> and the houses are simple. these beautiful yeah. pastel colors, very simple structures with windows, these rectang you know, the rectangle windows that you see in these paintings. And this was, you know, something that had, I think, probably, or at least he allows me to think, informs his, his work today. Um, Patrick, do you want to say anything more about this? I do want to say something. So yeah. It's hard to see, especially with a light as position, because it's, gl it's glare, but you could look at it later. But it's a little village. And I do remember loving those images. I was six years old. Um, and my dad was in the army, so he was stationed in Germany for a year. I almost hung it next to this yellow painting over here on that vent. And I swear to God, in the middle of that picture is a little yellow house with a blue roof and a white chimney. I thought, I can't believe it. And believe it, I didn't look at that. I'm thinking, that is crazy. Mm -hmm. So I must have had that stored somewhere yes, for a yeah. long time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank wow. you. I'm going to um, ask you some questions, Sherm. And um, so Sherm Pridham, I, I, I'll share with you that one of the things that has always uh, drawn me to these paintings are the windows. I find them um, utterly fascinating. Um, partly because you can't see in, you know, they're, they're opaque, the paint is, is opaque, they aren't, they aren't translucent, and some of the windows are very dark, and some are filled with light, and I like to imagine the life inside, and Sherm uh, lived here, as you all know, and so um, Elizabeth um, invited me to meet Sherm, which was a great, great delight, and uh, begin to talk with him about his life inside these wonderful homes. And you'll see these uh, photographs, if you haven't before the talk tonight, you can look at them at the end of the evening. These are all images from inside the homes that uh, Sherm lived in, Drisco and Loud, right, Sherm? Right. Yep. And uh, the beautiful, the joy you see in these wonderful photographs of family life. Um, so, Sherm, let's start with... Um, a question about Patrick's paintings. I wonder if there's anything about these paintings that um, feels familiar to you or not. Um, what they point toward or away from in relation to your own childhood experience of home. Yeah, I, I uh, when uh, you asked me to you know to, to uh, come and speak on on the paintings, I thought, man, you're looking at somebody who makes a philistine look pretty sharp. Um, uh, I know very little about painting and especially less about abstract art um, and I, I, I worried about that and, I, and so uh, <laughs> well uh, one of the things a couple of things that have been said and, and that have reacted to um, and I don't know how to put it into words and I think that's probably a good thing but yeah there, there were a couple of places I, I could find them in walking by and I, I was fortunate enough to come here and, and uh, um, they let me in by myself, and that was great. And as I did, the, as I walked around, I, I immediately, not only did I recognize it, I was in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, was, I was literally pulled in it. I mean, that sounds kind of dramatic, but I was. I was pulled in it. And one of them, and I, and I immediately knew what it was, you've got a couple of them who, you have the juxtaposition, I'm not sure of the colors, but you have the juxtaposition of Drisco in the next house, the alleyway. Mm -hmm. And the alleyway, uh, <laughs> this sounds terrible. I was really attracted to that alleyway. Sure. <laughs> That's why I wanted to be a librarian. Um, but the alleyway was, was a kind of a magical place for a kid. I mean, that, we used to come out of the bat cave screaming and hollering, you know, and shooting our cap guns and all that. Mm -hmm. So it was a magical place. But 
Before that, I, I wonder, you know, like you were saying about the village in Germany, a sense of place is a very mysterious thing for me. And, and I've always felt that here as a kid I did growing up, a very magical place. And I didn't know what was, you know, outside this area. So this is all I knew. But I knew that it was, there was an attraction somehow that was not words. It was a different kind of attraction. Maybe it was the color. Maybe it was the shapes. Who knows? But um, as I get older, I think I'm learning more and more to just let that be. Because I'm the kind of person I want to know, hey, Patrick, what's, what's the story you're telling? You know, I always need to know the story. What's the story? How's it going to end? And I need to get over that a little bit so I can enjoy you know, what is right in front of me. Uh, so that's Thank what you. happens with Patrick's paintings to me. And I love the, I love the color. And I, I love you know, the fact that you're in it. You, know, you, just, you, look at, you look at it, and bang, you're there. You know, at least I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things, though, that, that we had talked about before, Kimberly, I did want to comment, is that, uh, and I think, Patrick, you said that, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, but the windows, rather than being any great symbolism, you just use them because you can use more color. Well, they're, they're kind of notes in a composition. Yeah. If you think of a musical composition, and, and, a, and a little square on the painting is a place where sound occurs. Yeah. And so you're, you're moving that shape back and forth with value and color, yeah. trying to get the, the sound that works and pulls the whole piece together. Yeah. So they, they're windows, but they're really just places yeah. to help you know, bring the whole painting up. The, the, if one tries to interpret you know, the paintings with windows that are closed and therefore you know, get into the, the idea, the notion that the neighborhood was somehow locked in and it was not to the outside, it was private, it was whatever, exactly the opposite. Uh, windows were to see through, windows were houses were to go into. Uh, we, if you look at these uh, pictures, the Driscoll House and the Loud House, kids were in and out of the houses constantly. I would go to uh, somebody's house and be sitting there at dinner time, and, and the mother would say, do your mother know you're here? Yeah. And I'd say, uh, no. And she'd say, well, you better go home and make sure that it's OK for you to be here, because you're not going to eat here unless you get permission. So I'd go home and say, Mom, Mrs. Kimball invited me over to eat. So uh, that's, that's what we do. I mean, it's, that's the way you work. You know? uh, she was a good cook. Uh, so the, and the, another quick anecdote is that that very alley <laughs> that I was talking about, uh, I've told this story before, but I kind of like it. We had, a we had a television, it was in the Driscoll house in the corner, and the house next to us back in those days went out further than it does now, so that the window in that house was close across the alleyway to the window in the Driscoll house and looked directly into the TV. Um, and one night my father and my uncle were watching the Friday Night Fights, and my father, for whatever reason, just pulled the curtain down and very shortly, he got, a, he, got a, he got a knock on the door, and it was the people next door, and they said, you know, we're listening to the fight. We got the family. We're drinking a couple of beers. Would you put the shade up so we can watch? So my father said, well, please, come on, come on in and watch. And they said, no, 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 we're having, a, we're having a good time with our family. You just go about your business. But would you please put the curtain back up? So, put the curtain back up. so curtains were not. I didn't see that story coming. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sherm. Um, Sherm, one of the things I'm aware of in, from con the conversation you and I had, uh, I, we enjoyed this past glorious summer um, sitting out here uh, out in the sunshine one day, Patrick and Elizabeth and Sherm and I, and one of the things I was thinking about as I was listening to Sherm talk about his life here is that my experience anyway of Patrick's paintings is that there's a, there's a kind of serenity to them. There's a kind of stillness and a quiet to them that I really appreciate. Um, but as I listened to Sherm, and you've just heard a little a bit of this now, serenity, calm, quiet, stillness, maybe not <laughs> adjectives he would use to describe his life here. And I wonder, Sherm, if you would Give us a picture of that more of what of what you've just you you know you've just begun. Give us give us another picture of what life was like here for you as a child, as you moved in and among these houses and as you played with your friends. I remember there was a story about driving or pretending to drive oh. old cars <laughs> on the property. Anyway, wherever this takes you is fine. Yeah. The. Um, the, 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 the word that comes into my mind is uh, safe. Uh, serenity, nah, not so much, but 
uh, I always felt safe here, and it, it came as a shock to me that people were, you know, kids that I knew later on in my life in high school, junior high school, my mother wouldn't let me come down there, and I thought, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, I mean, look at the, those, those kids would beat you up big time, right? Uh, there, was, there was, of course, the competition and the roughness and all that, but I always felt very safe here. Uh, you know, the, the kids took care of me. I was an only child for quite a long time. And, um, and it was, you had everything to do. It was just amazing. We had, think about it, you got 10 acres. You got 10 acres of playground. Uh, were there junkyards? Yeah, there were. And the junkyards, one of them at least was wonderful. Other ones were real junkyards that were crappy. But this one junkyard, and I think Kimberly's referring to that, is, was right across from my grandmother's house. It was, my grandmother's house was right in, it was a garden, a two block garden. It was uh, kind of a neighborhood garden that, uh, that was done by volunteers, and they had arbors and all that kind of, it was be very beautiful. But right across from that was a junkyard. I mean, the juxtapositions were quite interesting. Now, the junkyard is a place, one of our favorite playgrounds, because we'd say, what do you want to do today? I don't want to play basketball. Well, let's go play in the junkyard. Okay, great. So you go down to one of the seven stores in the neighborhood, probably Ethel Smarts, because that was the cleanest and one of the nearest. You get the penny candy. You grab a bunch of penny candy. Four or five of you would go into the junkyard, and they had those old 1920, 1930 cars. The only thing that was missing were the motors. And the tires were gone, usually, too. And a lot of them had canvas roofs that were, you know, they were ripped open. So what you'd do is you'd go in there, play cops and robbers, and you'd be hanging out of the cars and shifting the gears and screaming and hollering, you know. And it was just, a, it was a wonderful playground. It was great until Mr. Who's came and threw us out. <laughs> Mr. Lewis threw you out. <laughs> yeah. He claimed it was his junkie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, one of the things I bet we've, an experience we've probably all had um, of perhaps going back to, as an adult, returning to a place uh, from our childhood. Maybe you go back and you visit an elementary school or you visit an old neighborhood and you're very aware of the, the very real uh, resonant experience of your own remembered time there and and a kind of disjunction between that and what's there now even though it's possible not much has changed but there's the sense of 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 everything having changed and there you are standing you know one foot in your own past experience and one in in your present moment and i wonder sherm you know th that experience of disjunction um in your case, is, is probably um, huge, writ large, because this place looks nothing like. Uh, so tell me, tell us what, what it's like for you to revisit this place now. It's, it's, gotten, <laughs> it's gotten, I guess, more familiar. And, and um, initially, you know, uh, as most of, many of you know, not all of you, uh, we didn't leave because we wanted to. We were evicted. Uh, not a pleasant time. It was very unpleasant. And that took a long time to get over. You know, the, the, um, and I'm not over it, but I, I certainly feel better about it than I did. Um, but what I feel good about is uh, coming back here and seeing that my uh, past is being not only preserved, but is being uh, looked at more carefully and, and, and treated with respect. And frankly, I compare with uh, my friends in the North End who lost everything. I mean, they, their houses are gone. Not only are their houses gone, there's nothing really except the park bench to remember, to remember what, you know, what their life was like there. That's why one of the things we're doing is trying to get, uh, with Elizabeth's help and other people's, you know, the uh, stories of, of growing up in, in these neighborhoods because we don't want to lose it. You know, we, want to, we want to preserve it and, and cherish it, frankly. You know, so that's, that's, what, uh, that's what happens when I come back. I see the ghosts. Thank you. Thank you. I love <clears throat> your word, cherish. And I'm going to stop there, and it's your turn now. What questions do you have um, about uh, Patrick's work and um, how he sees um, Elizabeth wor Elizabeth's work and how she sees Sherm's life here and what he remembers and how, what his relationship is to this place now? Or anything else that may have occurred to you and not occurred to me um, I'd love to hear your questions. And I have a walk around mic. So I'm going to walk around. And uh, you'll ask your question into the mic. Who has a question? I do. Okay, Art. <laughs> Give us your name. Test, test, test. No, it's not working. And you don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> you do not need it. 
That's, that's a good question, and uh, you know, as a young kid, I had zero uh, uh, feeling for old things and you know historical things. I, I just didn't have it, so I didn't pay attention to it. Um, and how that happened, I don't know. I mean, you know, it just that we were gone, and and, uh, and those couple three were preserved. And it was I, I know now, you know, why it was because they looked at it, and they they saw that you know it had historical significance and so forth. Um, but part of part of what I think is happening now is that we're looking more at other parts of history and valuing them more. Uh, some of the houses that were torn down maybe wouldn't be now because they're they're of interest, um, and I think it would be a different kind of a story now that we would have here. It would be a different story now, and also. The three houses that Sherm's family lived in, which is Shapley, Drisco, Sherburn, and Loud, all appear on that map of 1812 that was sort of the original starting point for what would be preserved and what wouldn't. But now, most of those 19th century and even 20th century buildings would be preserved as well. You know, the center was just an old house. You lived in a very old house. Oh, yeah. True. Yeah, and uh, yes, exactly. And, and, uh, the, uh, I'll tell the story quickly. The, the other part of that, yeah, it was a very old house. My dad, when he came back from overseas, uh, we lived in the Driscoll at that time. We moved from my grandmother's house to Loud House to Driscoll House. It was a rental house. My dad wanted to paint the outside of the house. The landlord said if he did, he'd throw him in jail because he didn't want his taxes to go up. So my father and I worked on the inside. One of the pictures that you'll see there is the, uh, the foot my dad would paint the fireplace and make it look like a fireplace and all that sort of thing. So people did what they could on the inside, knowing they couldn't do it on the outside. Uh, and that, you know, that sort of skewed uh, the houses too, I think. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. So I'm not in that much control, really, in terms of subject. And sometimes what I like to say is when I'm finishing a painting, I follow the curious edge of the canvas. There's something in the painting that I'm doing at that moment that is like some part of it that suggests a journey. And then I, I jump into that place. It could be about a color. It could be about a, a shape. It could be about another kind of house, maybe similar. Could be anything, but I do seem to find enough interest in the kind of game I'm playing right now to keep playing it for a long time because there's so much to do in it, you know. So. I'm not encouraging change. I'm just yeah. curious. Well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. As a, <laughs> as a word person, I'm curious about architectonic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you just say briefly what that word means? I'm sorry. What does architectonic mean? Architectonic. Uh, the the uh, just the the great geometries, the, okay. the 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 placement of the elements, uh, 
Um, the very classic forms, the one-on-one -on -one rooms, the, I mean, they're terrific. I mean, yeah. it's really, I own a bunch of speeches, so I, I mean, I really appreciate it. I was just curious as to whether that was the genre of the future or not. I understand. Thank you. I just love the word, tectonic. It sounds like things are moving. <laughs> just. Uh, sure, I love your definition of North End because I've heard it too over the years, and it's just not clear to me. Is what? It's not clear to me. Oh. Where where you might mean by the North End? Yeah, uh, it is not clear. It's been, and it, I'm sure if you talk to some people, they'll give you a different version of North End. Um, I don't know if I can do it in my head any longer, but high, uh, you know, High Street, you know, the street uh, where the. Um, uh, the buildings are that have been preserved. That's that was the North End, where my grand, my uh, god, godmother and godfather were. That was the North End. Um, I'm not sure that exactly. You know if that helps you at all. But it was that that area. Um, it was the North End Farragut School, uh, which is totally. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Pat. save it by doing this, that, and the other thing. WPA and all the lots of stuff happened. But people knew, I think, and that's why you had a lot of absentee landlords. This place ain't going anywhere. So that was, you know, you're kind of hanging on. People weren't putting money into the properties, etc. So that eviction process was begun then, I think. The actual eviction was when Portsmouth Housing Authority had the authority to buy your house and evict you. And the way that worked is that uh, you had, um, market value was given to your house, you had X amount of time to get out, you had $200 maximum to um, help you relocate. Uh, rather than provide you with a house, you were directed that there were some houses available and there was a housing shortage. Uh, so housing was you know, very difficult to find. And that, my grandmother was evicted in, I have it too, I don't have it, 1961, I think. Think. That was before that. Adam, I'm, sure. I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the date. But I, I got the eviction notice, and it ain't pretty. It says, uh, you know, you, you can never sue anybody for anything you're out of here. You know, that kind of thing. It was, it was painful. Neighborhoodness 
that was strawberry bank is being captured again. Because um, I think in Quits with the particular, some of us are a little concerned that we're losing our neighborhood blissness again with some of uh, what's happening with our, our housing values. And so, so I think this is a good uh, experience for us and a good remembering for us and a good honoring for us. And I thank you for doing that. And I do love having you. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yes, let me turn around. That, that painting is actually the red house over here, Joan's house. Yeah, it's actually that house, but you're standing you're kind of over on the east side, on the west side of it, looking this way. And I changed so many things, you wouldn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I just love the structure of that house. It's that red house. Yeah, I know, yeah. And I'm not colorblind. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just, it's, yeah, it's, it's the space, really. It's the chin, one of the chimneys you see is, I think, in the painting. Yeah, over the yellow, yellow yeah. yeah, it's it's a little. That one gets a little off abstract, let's say. Yeah. So that's great. We sort of planned that 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 experience of seeing <laughs> and how we see these so two Kimberly, these places. Are you yes, wrapping it up. I am. Could I say one thing? Please. So I, it was really a blast to be here since May painting. Um, on, on the camp, I call it a campus, on the campus. And absolutely thank you, Elizabeth Farish, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun to be here. And then also to have a show, awesome place to have a show. And your assistant, um, Amanda, and of course, Larry Yurden. So anyway, this was, it was an honor to be here. And then thank everybody here for coming out, taking your time out of your day. So thank you. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you. Thank you, Sherm, and thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, thank you, you, really. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to just acknowledge PPM TV has been here this evening recording this event, and Douglas Green has been helping with the sound. I am uh, wanting to close with words from Saint Exupéry. Um, what is essential is in invisible to the eye, and I've heard in much of what we've shared tonight that uh, so much of what is deeply important to us is hard to actually render or capture. Um, so thank you all so much for being here and enjoy the rest of this lovely evening. Thank you.